Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dropping the Gloves. It feels like forever, doesn't it, Tim? Since we've had an episode, but it, I guess it's only Wednesday. We had one Monday. Obviously, that was not a normal episode, but we're back. Tim and I here on the Nation Network. Very excited to bring you another episode. The playoffs have started in a big way. We're already to game two, approaching game three in some series, and we haven't even given you our picks. It's crazy. Not that you care about our picks. Nobody does, but it it checks that box of narcissistic just fuel that I need. You know, it's all about me. It's all about Tim. We want you guys to think that we know what we're talking about. We feel like you need to know our picks and what we think about every series, right? Because we're experts. And that's what we're going to do today because it just, it feels like we haven't talked in a while. I'm talking to the listeners right now. So we're going to get into the playoffs. But first, Tim, how are you doing? How's everything going in your life? Yeah, it's going well. It's going well. I've been watching a lot of hockey right now. I'm excited to get into it. Um, and there's a couple of big storylines in particular that I want to start with just because, I don't know, we don't need to analyze every game. People watch the games. People read the news. They're, they're on Twitter. I don't need to break down each series and game line by line. But there's some big stuff that's worth getting into that I want to kind of talk about. I do, too. And we're only going audio today because I got a, I got a little bloody nose this morning. You ever blow your nose, Tim? And it just Never. won't stop bleeding? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's tough. It's happening. So I just stuffed a, 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 a nose clotter in there. People call them a tampon, which is a big wad of paper towel in there. So we're not going to do audio or video because I don't think people need to see that. Don't you, Tim? What do you think? Do you think it's a good look? No, I think we should uh, protect the people from what I'm looking at right now. So It ain't pretty. It ain't pretty, I'll tell you that much. So we will protect you. You know what? I didn't, didn't get protected, Tim, this weekend. My kids. We played a game of Monopoly, first time ever. I've been itching to get them into the board games. You know, we play, what do we play? We we play Candyland. We play Go Fish. We play War. We play those types of games. We don't play any strategic skill games. And uh, we, we busted up Monopoly for the first time. Let me tell you what. I took those kids behind the woodshed, and I dominated <laughs> this game. I'm absolutely ruthless when it comes to this. I was trading. They had no idea what was going on. I was really selling them on the railroads, which I do enjoy, but you can't trade a railroad for an orange and a red. Like <laughs> that just give me the whole corner. The game lasted about 15 minutes, but it was a lot of fun. And so I'm hoping to continue the Monopoly because I I grew up playing Monopoly with my friends. Like I, I, I almost lost lifelong friendships over that game. Like we're talking a week long game where you're playing every night after school, you go to your friend's house and the board's still set up. You count your money. You make sure, you know, you have the same amount when you start and it just gets ridiculous. So I, I love, did you have any, uh, friends when you were younger, Tim? <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, oh, which surprising, which daughters played with you? Cause not all of them, obviously. Right. No, many... just the two oldest, Ava and Gabriella, Ava's 12, Gabriella's 10. So they, they understand how it works. They just weren't grasping. You have to strategize. Ava got it a little bit. She wouldn't trade with me once I started to roll. But Gabrielle was just completely like, yeah, I'll trade with you, Dad. Sounds good. Whatever you want. <laughs> just fleeced her. Fleeced her every trade. I was such a jerk. But I won. That's funny. That's how they learned. Everybody was happy. I won. You got to learn somehow, right? You got to learn lessons. Speaking of lessons, NHL teams are learning lessons right now. And we're going to go over those biggest stories. And it's actually interesting. There's a lot of individual storylines to talk about right now. Usually it's a team. Usually it's a strategy. Usually it's what are we going to do? It's very rare where there's a lot of individual players either making an impact or missing games or hurt this early in the playoffs. But let's get into it. The Vancouver Canucks jumped out one nothing on the Nashville Predators. They beat them first game. Very good. Game two, there's a noticeable absence between the pipes for the Vancouver Canucks is their two-time All-Star goaltender, Thatcher Demko. He's out. He missed some time this year with a knee injury. That was supposedly healed up. This is a different injury, apparently, but no one will say in the playoffs. They just say it's a lower body injury. No one knows what that means, but apparently it's serious enough that he has been listed out for the rest of this series, potentially, which spells big, 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 big news for the Vancouver Canucks because last night they played the – they played the Nashville Predators without Thatcher Demko, and they fell 4-1 to one with an empty net goal. Thatcher, or Casey DeSmith, his backup, gave up three goals to him on only 15 shots. I am not a mathematician, but that is not a good save percentage. That is no bueno. Does this spell the end of the Vancouver Canucks for you? Is this a big deal? 
Well, okay. <clears throat> I didn't watch the game last night, so I can't what? say that the Smith played terribly, although he looking at terrible. that line, yeah, right. So um, <sighs> this is tough because the Smith is a solid goalie. Like, as no, far he's as not. Backups, as far as backups go, he's one of the better backups in the league. Right? False. Yes, he is. Yes, he Tim, is. This year, he was 12, 9, and 6. Save percentage of 8, 9, 6. Is that good yeah, numbers for a backup? Year. Not a great season. He was good in Pittsburgh. It doesn't matter. He's. Um, I'm, I'm going to call a spade a spade. This guy's not a good backup. Vancouver is a really good team from top Correct. to bottom. Yes. But you lose out Markstrom. I would even say like they're in trouble now. You know what I mean? Like it's not just a. Does this hurt their chances of a long playoff run? They allowed four goals to, Van, to Nashville last night and didn't look themselves at all. And we talked about this the other day on Monday. Like what happens when you don't trust your goalie? It's not just the saves that are getting impact. Everyone is impacted because yeah. it changes the way you play. And Vancouver is not the kind of team where, like I would think about, like a Tampa or a Boston or those veteran, experienced teams where you think they could overcome it just because of like the leadership and stuff like that. And I'm not knocking Vancouver, but this is the new playoff team. This is the young core. I don't know. This is the group that's going to be able to overcome something like that. They should be able to get by the Nashville Predators, you would think. But you you had an interesting little find. You said this is nothing new for the Vancouver Canucks. They have a historical issue in recent playoff runs going back to Markstrom, Ryan Miller, Corey Schneider, all of them getting injured in the playoffs. So I don't know what's going on in, in Vancouver. In the first round, no less. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that crazy that this is just a consistent theme with this team? Their goaltenders bowing out with injuries. But I will say I, I do – I do have faith in the Vancouver Canucks. They made a lot of good moves this offseason. I think they have grown from last year. I, th I think their head coach has a lot to do with that. He's instilled confidence. He's instilled discipline. They're not just a run-and-gun team who need a lot of things to go right to win. Rick Tockett is a, just – I think he's changed the culture in Vancouver. I think they'll be fine. The first game, getting a new goal turn in the playoffs, it, it's, it's a little bit of – it's just chaos. You know, everybody doesn't know what's going on. Is Thatcher playing? Is he not playing? Casey DeSmith gets the net, and everybody's just out of sorts. And they didn't have a bad game. They just couldn't score. And then Casey DeSmith himself must have just been his head spinning. What's going on? Am I am I playing? Am I not? What's Thatcher's status? No one knows. And all of a sudden, you're starting game two of the Stanley Cup playoffs. And it's a lot to overcome. He'll be better in game three. The Canucks will be better in game three. And they have a solid team. When you look at like their defense, Tim is really, really good. So I, I think they'll be fine. But if it goes further than round one, they're in big trouble. Like, they, they can't expect to win in round two with Casey to Smith between the pipes. Like, you, you're playing the Edmonton Oilers or you're playing the Vegas Golden Knights. Or I don't know how the, the matchup works out, but you're playing like a Stanley Cup contending team in round two. Like, this isn't a cupcake you're lucky you got Nashville in round one, but it's a big deal for them. Thatcher Demko needs to heal up because they have no chance without him. All right, moving on. Staying in Canada, the north of the border. Tim, what the heck's going on with Willie Nylander? I wish I could tell you. Um, he did not play again in game two on, on Monday, even though he skated with the team in the morning. So he's like, if he's with the team, he's practicing. There's all kind of rumors swirling that even like, did he even get like healthy scratch or something go on with it? Oh, goodness. Obviously, I, I, I can't imagine that would ever be the case. Something's going on with the injury, but it would have to be a lot for him to, to miss a playoff game when he's that important. So um, no clear you know report on what exactly that is. Will he play tonight is the question. Chris Johnston reported this morning in Toronto that he would be, quote unquote, surprised if he didn't play. So he should be back in the lineup. And I got to say, as a Boston fan, that makes me nervous. Uh, you, the momentum swung back in their favor. Now they're going back to Toronto and bringing in arguably their most important playoff producer. So... Uh, tough series ahead of us, but I think Nylander will probably be back. Yeah, I have no clue what's going on with them. All I know is the Leaf looks, Leafs look pretty good in game two. They looked, uh, they looked <laughs> really dangerous. Austin Matthews, he that has played two, yeah. he's played two very good games. Even in game one, he was the Leafs' best player. He played very, very solid. So he's, he's definitely picked up his play. I know I'm critical of the Leafs and their core, especially not picking it up in the playoffs. I've been impressed with him and. Both games so far, even though they got shelled 5-1 in the first game. All right, moving on. Connor McDavid, let's just stay north of the border. Let's pander to the Canadian audience today. Connor McDavid, everybody was questioning him. Not questioning him, but questioning the Edmonton Oilers. Can they win with just him and Dreinsidel? Do they have the depth? 
do they have what it takes to, you know, get past one, two, three rounds? The LA Kings coming in, a very formidable defensive team. You got Dano, you got Kopitar, you got Dowdy on the back end. All eyes will be focused on Connor McDavid. They're going to shut him down. Can these other guys produce? Who cares? McDavid's, he is the Michael Jordan of hockey. You cannot stop him no matter what you throw at him. He puts up five assists, Tim. Can you believe this? Five assists in the first game in the NHL playoffs going against the LA Kings playing their their vaunted 1-3-1 that no one can get through the neutral zone. You have to dump it in. It's impossible to gain speed with this team. He carved them. He diced them. He's, his spinorama moves are so pretty. He had two of them this game that led to goals. That's a very hard move to do, to do with speed, to control the puck, and to come out at the end of the 360 and have the awareness to be dishing with your head up. Like it's, he makes it look so effortless. His footwork is just impeccable. No one can do what he does. And he does it as an, at an insane speed that is just very impressive to watch. But can, can LA contain him? That's my question to you, Tim. Can they? Sure. Will they? I don't know. I mean, I said on Monday, my prediction was McDavid would average more than two points per game in this playoff. Right now, it's looking low. Now, obviously, McDavid's not going to have five points every game, and he's going to have a game where he probably has zero. Uh, I don't think it's going to be tonight. I think you're going to see another big performance from him tonight at home. Not to mention Zach Hyman with a hat trick. Like These guys are just so good when they're good, right? And obviously, when they're not, it's a whole different team. It's very frustrating highs and lows. Probably, maybe among all the playoff teams, the biggest difference between their, their ceiling and their floor. I think it's probably uh, maybe Vancouver, but Edmonton would be up there too. So uh, they won game one, seven to four, looking pretty lopsided. I think LA will make it a series. It w- I don't think they're going to be this kind of blown out every game, but right now it's looking like Edmonton's heading to the second round. I tell you what the Kings did wrong. They, f- they tried to bully the Edmonton Oilers. They were too focused on playing the physical game. Every chance they could to get a hit, they did. And they were taking themselves out of position they need to go back to just playing solid, defensive, passive hockey, and they'll be fine. I, I just think they focus on that too much. I think they, they have something like 70 hits, which is incredible. It's a, it's a lot of hits. I think the Islanders-Hurricanes game combined had 60-something. And they themselves, the LA Kings, had 70. So it's just there's a point to be physical, and then there's a point where you're just taking yourself out of the play in order to be physical. You have to just toe that line when it's there, take it. If it's not there, you can't put yourself out of position when you're playing against 97. He'll dominate you. He'll make you look silly. And I think Drew Doughty did that. I think a couple forwards did that. And McDavid made him pay. Speaking of physicality, Tim, Matt Rempe, our, our future friend of the show this offseason, you would think he has to come on. I pretty much cha- changed the course of his career by molding him, mentoring him. He uh, had quite the impact for the New York Rangers. Game one. First goal, maybe his second or third shift of the game. Limited minutes, tough guy. Would you, did you like that when he scored the first goal of the series versus the watch? Do you like that, Tim? <laughs> yeah. No, I loved it. Yeah, and it was a good goal, too. Good hockey play, you know what I mean? Like, you see him in wow. the corner, you see him, yeah. you watch the play develop, you go through in good position, you know what I mean? Like, nothing fancy, but you can see the professionalism there, and it's good. And I think it's just cool for a guy that was called up midseason, all these all – these, uh, attention on him he wasn't even guaranteed a roster spot in the playoffs there was an argument against him you know not even being in the lineup he comes in and he scores a goal first goal of the postseason for the rangers which is pretty cool to see and uh even in limited minutes because i i you notice him every time he's on the ice so you think oh gosh he must be up to seven eight minutes now it was like less than two you know what yeah. i mean like it's crazy at the point that i was watching but he does make an impact in, in his limited minutes and the rangers look to her pretty good right now they're up to nothing well, his first shift, he took a run at somebody, takes a two-minute penalty. So he definitely was – he was excited. He was ready to go. And then for a young kid, you want to you want to make an impact. You got to you know, take it easy, Matt. So good for him, good for the New York Rangers, and we'll get into it a little bit. The, the Capitals suck. <laughs> like, they really are bad. And when, when you're that bad, it's, it's hard. All right, moving on, Tim. What's going on in Vegas? Yeah, I just wanted to – acknowledge this we we beat the mark stone thing to death everyone knows the whole ltir story and vegas cap circumnavigation whatever um but i just it's so perfect that in his first shift he scored the goal and a typical mark stone goal you know deflection right in the uh, the dirty areas out front and 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's just salt to the wound if you're one of the the people who are frustrated by this, or if you're a Dallas fan that you know this is your matchup. Yeah. You get the best record in the West, and you play a team that's the reigning Cup winners, is probably even better than last year. Um, it's a tough pill to swallow, but Mark Stone, good for him, and he said like, it, "I feel great. I'm ready to go." And uh, yeah, just tough. Uh, it's tough if you're a Dallas fan. It's BS. There should be an investigation into this, and and it's gotten to the point where it's almost laughable that they're allowed to do this. It just it coincides that you're 100 percent ready the first game of the playoffs. How the heck does that happen? It really is. It irks me a little bit because we had Matt Duchesne on the show. We're pretty much best friends now. You could tell he wasn't a fan of this Mark Stone LTIR shenanigans. You get Thomas Hurdle, you get Noah Hannafin, and then you get Mark Stone back. It it just it's irksome for a player. You work so hard all season long. You t- finish at the top of your division. You're ready to go. And then you get to face a team that's just cheating. And you have to face this juggernaut of a team that adds all these star players and gets their best player back, arguably Mark Stone, who is 100%, who could have probably been playing a month ago, Tim. His spleen. This actually, it, it annoyed me when he scored. I, we texted back and forth and we were talking like, that's perfect. It is perfect in a sense that it just solidifies the fact that they were cheating they were cheating there's no way that this guy gets healthy first game of the playoffs comes in and makes an impact and then after the game says i'm ready to go I'm perfect yeah i feel great you could have played before this there needs to be some kind of investigation there needs to be checks and balances you can't just all of a sudden a month before the playoffs or the trade deadline say oh my best player's hurt and his spleen's hurt uh oh, uh oh, he's going to be out for a while. Looks like we got an extra nine million to go and spend. It just it reeks of cheating, and I'm tired of it. This needs to this needs to be taken care of. Anyways, moving on. Unless you have any other issue with it, Tim. No, the last one I want to touch on is the Bruins goalie tandem. Um, and so they went with Swayman in game one. He played excellent. I don't have it in front of me, but allowed only one goal and played very very well. And he's had the least number all season long. He's, he's been excellent against the Leafs. Everyone was asking the question, who starts game two? Um, because in the last 30 or so games of the season, they were alternating every other automatically. Both guys are healthy. Both guys are playing well. They just want every other. And they were going to keep it going in the playoffs, which to me, I take some issue with. Now, we lost game two. I'm, we as the Bruins, Allmark was not at fault for that. He played excellent. He played yep. very, very well. Big, big saves, through traffic, rebounds, all that. I don't blame him for really any of the goals. Um, but I still don't think it was the right choice. And I I tweeted this out. I'm not just saying that. I tweeted this out the other day. I think after Swayman's performance in game one, you you say, okay, Swayman, you have game two, and regardless of outcome, Allmark, you have game three. That way they know, Allmark knows he's going in when, Swayman knows that regardless of how he plays, he doesn't have to like think about, oh, I played poorly, so I lost my job. You set the expectations clearly. Swayman played excellent in game one. You give him game two, and then if 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 you're committed to some kind of split then you tell all he's get game three rather than going every other it just doesn't make any sense to me well what if they did that before the playoffs and jim montgomery sat him down and he said we're going every other regardless of how you play <laughs> yeah maybe no no i don't like that and it's funny too because montgomery was like saying like hey they asked him on uh monday morning who's who starts tonight and he goes i didn't tell my wife i'm not telling you you know he's, he didn't, he's he didn't told the goalies the they know always he he they didn't know yeah yeah. yeah, and I, usually I hate this. Usually I say go with the hot hand. But this is a smart move by Jim Montgomery. It it absolves him completely of any blame. I don't think I don't think so. I disagree. 100%. I think he's like I did it during line. the regular season. I'm going to continue doing it during the doing it during the playoffs and as soon as some goalie plays bad, then he'll switch. That's what he should do. I don't mind this. I really don't. When you have two goalies as good as these two are, you got to play to your strengths. I, I get it. I, I think this is more for Jim Montgomery's sake. Because if you bench Allmark and you go with Swayman, then all of a sudden Swayman falters and you switch. It was it was a, with Robin Lehner and Mark andre Fleury. It was, it was a contentious situation. The goalies both wanted to start. You can tell there was issues there. And the same could happen here. But if he's up front, he said, we're going every other. As soon as <clears> someone <throat> falters, we're going to have to, you know, maybe go with one guy. So it, they're they're both potentially Vesna Trophy winners. Allmark won it last year. Swain is going to be up for the award this year. Like, they're both great goalies. So what do you do? I don't know. He did well, it during the regular season. 
Yeah, the tough thing was that I think people are very critical, including myself, of how Montgomery handled it last year. He held on to Allmark for too long. It was his net through like three games, I think. And he didn't go to Swayman until game four. Then I think he gave Swayman game seven, which is so much pressure for a guy that just hadn't played. You know what I mean? Yep. Uh, and all the momentum's going against you. So one of the things he did was give Swayman game one. He hadn't started this playoff series ever before uh, because it was Allmark last year and Tuca before that. And so that was a big thing for him to to get that chance. And Swayman wanted the chance to start a series with a clean slate. But I think Montgomery's line job could be on the line with these choices because you have – the the probably the better goalie in my mind, but certainly a goalie who played very well in game one. I think most coaches in the league go with him again for game two. Um and so I think I think Montgomery's sticking his neck out a little bit with this. Yeah. I think he's doing a fine job. It's it's one one. I, I don't think you can I think he's doing okay. During the regular season they had almost identical stats. Yeah. Yeah. I know. You know, like Get it. Swayman twenty five and ten. Allmark twenty two and ten. Save percentage nine sixteen nine fifteen. Goals against two five three two five seven. They're the same goalie. It's so, pretty wild. Yeah, yeah. It's it's identical. It's remarkable how close they are. So Swayman will go again tonight, and that's fine. And if they win, it'll go back to Allmark. I think that's the way it should go. But then it gets tricky for Game Seven. It's like, oof. all right, moving on couple teams have already played two games and a couple teams are down 0-2 and the question is tim is it time to panic because what i always say what what do we always say on this show when does the series start tim popped out of the womb the doctor said it's a boy and tim said the playoffs don't start until when do the home team loses boom and the teams we're going to talk about have been, been the road team so far and they're all down zero to two Question is, is it time to panic or is it just par for the course and we should just stick to our mantra? Playoffs don't start until the home team loses. Tampa Bay Lightning, Sunshine State battle. Very exciting stuff. Playing the Florida Panthers. Game went to overtime last night. Florida wins right away. Nice goal. Keith Kachuk in the crease and Vasilevsky's face. Who got the OT winner? I can't remember. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember either. Matthew Kachuk, though, not Keith. Who cares? They're all Kachuks. Anyways, Kachuk, Lightning are down 0 is, is it time to panic for the Tampa Bay Lightning team? Uh, I'm not panicked. Obviously, you don't want to be down 0-2. You're nervous about that. T- Florida is one of the best teams in the league, so there's all kinds of reasons that your, your guard is up, but I'm not in panic mode if I'm Tampa. They have... A talented roster. They have a veteran, experienced roster. They have a goaltender that can steal you a game, and they haven't played at home yet. And so of the teams that we're going to talk about, no, I don't think the Lightning are one of the teams that should be panicked. That's not to minimize the fact that they're in a hole, that statistically they're going to lose this series like 80% of the time when you go down 0-2, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not panicking yet. Just for the situation, I think the Lightning can easily come back. I don't know, Tim. I'd be a little worried because the best goaltender so far has been Sergei Bobrovsky. The Florida Panthers have gained that experience last year in the playoffs. They know how to win. They went up versus your vaunted Boston Bruins and dominated them when they went down 3-1. to one. I'd be a little nervous, especially because how Florida is playing. They're playing exactly the same way they did last year. Everybody knew their MO. Everybody knew what they were going to do this year. And so they braced for it. They tried to bring in heavier players. You saw Toronto beefed up a little bit. The Rangers went out and got some size. Even the Carolina Hurricanes knew what was what was in store for them. And they're doing it again. They're hitting. They're frustrating you. They're throwing everything at the net. And all of their goals are coming within three feet of the net. It's a rebound. It's a backdoor tap in. It's a off someone's butt for a, a greasy goal. That's how they do it. And who's right at the center of it? Matthew Kachuk. Two goals this game. He's laying all over Vasilevsky. First one was challenged. It counted. The second or the overtime goal, he's he's right in Vasilevsky's lap. As Carter Verhegg is cheering, Kachuk is on his back on Vasilevsky. So if you can't stop that, what can you do? I think Florida is too powerful. I love the Tarasenko pickup. And then going back to the goaltender, did you see Sergei Bobrovsky rob Matt Dunba at the end of the second period? Tampa Bay had come back. Florida went up 2-0. They had tied the game 2-2. Matt Dumna with a wide open net. Bobrovsky backwards, not even looking. His his eyes are facing the crowd, Tim. Backhand glove save. One of the prettiest saves I've ever seen. Matt Dumba 
You should be ashamed of yourself. Let's go right on the ice. But what a save. What did you think of that? Did you love that? Amazing. Yeah, I love those saves where they're not even looking. Like, he's <gasps> looking at the crowd behind him, and he just throws his arm back there. And that's like instinct. You know what I mean? <clears throat> that's not something you can train for, prepare for. It's just it's just goalie instincts kicking in. And, yeah, incredible save. That's Dominic Hasek. Like, that's, that's him. There's so many saves where he's just not even looking, throws his blocker across and gets the puck. But, boy, oh, boy. I, w- I will agree with you out of the three teams so far who were down 0-2. The Lightning have the biggest chance to come back just because they have been in the games. The day, game did go to overtime. The next two teams we're going to talk about, they've been outplayed, just hands down, top to bottom, every facet of the game. So I do think this series could easily be 2-2 come Saturday. So we'll see. Moving on to another team down 0-2, New York Islanders. Speaking of veteran team, been there, done that. This team, average age, I think is 38, maybe 40. This is an old-ass team. And they're playing like it. Going up with a Carolina Hurricane team that is well coached. They're motivated. They got some young guys in the lineup. They got some something to play for. Jake Gensel wants a Stanley Cup. Jordan Stahl wants a Stanley Cup. All these guys want some vindication. They always seem to be the bridesmaid, never the bride. Always make it to the, the tippity top, but never can quite get over the peak. This is their year. They went out, they got Jake Gensel. They're very excited for this playoffs and they're playing the New York Islanders. It didn't look good in game two, Tim. Hurricanes were down 3 nothing. Islanders were playing like garbage. Still managed to get three goals past Freddie Anderson. All of a sudden, something clicked. The Hurricanes said, you know what? It's time to play. And they put the work boots on. And then they took the New York Islanders behind the woodshed, as I like to say. And they beat the doors off of them. I'm talking to the, to the sense of... The, the shot attempts were 110 for the Hurricanes, which is, which is incredible. 110 times they fired the puck on the net. The Islanders did it 28 times. Shot attempts. The Islanders had shot attempts 28. The Islanders didn't get a shot for the first 15 minutes of the game. In the last two periods, the second and the third period, three shots. Three shots they had in the second and third period. That's crazy. I watch the Chicago Blackhawks all year long. Every game, mostly every game. They were not a great team at times. They they played well. They tried hard. They always got more than three shots on net in two periods. <laughs> always. And this is the playoffs. That's embarrassing for the New York Islanders. I, what, is this more a case of the Islanders just not being good? Or is this just the Hurricanes? They're just really solid, Tim. I think it's a little bit of both, but if I'm leaning one way, it's really it's disappointing for the Islanders than it is a credit to the Hurricanes. Just because, like like you said, it was almost two full periods where they had three shots on net. And the stat you had here, 81-0 and 0 all time, the Islanders were, when they were leading by three in the playoffs. Then you lose that game. Was wow. it in regulation, too? Oh, yeah. 5-3. Like, yeah. 5-3, yeah. Gosh, the Hurricanes just, pulled the goalie. They tied it up on Sebastian Ajo. Jordan Martin took nine seconds later, strips Noah Dobbs behind the net, and then they get an empty yeah. netter from Jake Gensel. Yeah, it was just a, a clinic the last two periods. Yeah, humiliating. So I don't know how you come back from that. You don't. You don't. They had no chance anyway. And even if like even if they had tied it up, I still would have said Canes in five. You know what I mean? Like I still wouldn't have given them any chance to win the series. But now I know the series hasn't started yet because they haven't lost at home, but I think the series is over. There's a way to lose where you, where you feel good about it. If it, the Islanders would have much rather been blown out seven to one, it's like, you know what? Off night, we got to come back, switch it up. We'll be fine at home. They were up three, nothing, and they were still playing really bad. And then you lose five to three in regulation. Like you mentioned, it's just, it's a tough way. You have to fly back. Can you imagine Patrick Waugh in the locker room? How irate he must've been like, that guy's a fiery guy. How pissed he must have been coming back into the locker room. You're up 3-1 three, three, in the third period. And then you give a four straight. Like, oh, my word. that. Do you think he's regretting taking this job? You know, he, he was sitting pretty in the queue, winning championships, living the life. Like, can, can you imagine the accolades he must have gotten in the queue all over the place? The guy's from Quebec. He won a cup with the Montreal Canadiens. He must walk on water in in Quebec. And then he comes to the New York Islanders, and it's just been, oh. He got into the playoffs, I'll give him that. But boy, oh, boy, this was a tough, 
tough first parlay on the road versus the Carolina Hurricane. I, I think this speaks more about how just dangerous the Hurricanes are. They're my Stanley Cup pick. They're they're whew, they're fun to watch. They really are. And we got a couple we got a couple friends of the show on that team. So we got a we got a rooting interest in this team. But anyways, moving on. The last team who is 0-2. The Washington Capitals, we touched on them earlier. They're down 0 2. Is there any chance this team even wins one game, Tim? <laughs> I'll give them a chance to win one game. Uh, the reason I say that is because Ovechkin hasn't played very well. Even oh, Spencer Carberry said, he said after the game, he looks off. Something's not right with him. Um, and so, you know what's I, not I right with him? He's old as dirt. <laughs> yeah. And you know what else is not right? These goals don't count towards the Gretzky record. So he shut it down. That's his sole focus in life now is to beat that record. So if it doesn't matter, playoffs, bah, I don't care. I'm focusing on next year. That's his mindset right now. You could even tell during the game, Tim, he had one shot attempt. He looks invisible. He's not engaged. Even in the offensive zone, he's just completely checked out. It's embarrassing. Even Caps fans are just like, what is Obi doing? Even Sucks in the power us. play. He's oh. just standing, standing still in his in his area and not moving, waiting for the one timer. That's embarrassing. It's honestly embarrassing. And if the Capitals did have a chance to pull out a game on the road, this was it because the Rangers played terrible for their standards. They were inconsistent. They were not engaged. It was just a, a tale of two teams out there in Game Two. There'd be stretches where the Rangers would really buckle down and play, and you could tell they were domin- the dominant team, and then they would switch. And there'd be long swaths of time, five, six, seven minutes, where they would just be lackadaisical, turning the puck over, not finishing the checks, and then Washington would get a little bit of a momentum. And then the Ranger would go, oh, well, we got to pick it up, and they'd score. And they'd go, okay, we got to play better. So if there was a game, that was it, because it's, gosh, they should not, it's frustrating. They should not be in the playoffs. Imagine Pittsburgh Penguins in there. You think, you think Crosby would just take two games off? Nope. Not a chance. Not a chance. It's, it, it, it's irksome. Even Detroit would be fun in this position. You Capitals fans drive me, you're driving me crazy. They're so bad. They're, they're ruining the playoffs for everybody. The Rangers get a cakewalk in the first round. Absolute cupcake because of Ovi sucks so bad. It's embarrassing. Absolutely atrocious. They should be ashamed of themselves. But maybe they'll, maybe they'll switch it up at home, and they'll, they'll have a change of heart, and they'll really play. That's those stinking Russians, Ovechkin. You know what I mean? Go back to Russia, where you do that crap in the KHL. In this country, we try hard. You know what I mean, Tim? A for effort. E for effort. I'm checking off countries. Poland, Czech, Russia, Czech. Here we go. I'm, I'm just taking out the whole Eastern Bloc. Who's on my, who's on my hit list next? Damn, who's it going to be? North Korea? Coming after you, Kim Jong-un. Rocket man. You're on my list. All right. You know what we didn't do? I mentioned in the start of the show, Tim, we did not give our picks for the champions. This is this is more between Tim and I. We have a running tally somewhere of series we win. I seem to win every year, so it's not really a competition. It's more can Tim improve a little bit. But this year we did our picks. We didn't give them out, so we're just going to run through them real quick. We're not going to spend too much time on this because the playoffs have already started. We're a little late to the game. I'll start with my picks in the East. Toronto-Boston. I know my bold prediction was Toronto all the way to the Stanley Cup, but I'm picking the Bruins. I just think Toronto is going to lose. Um, Rangers obviously will win. Hurricanes will win. And then I'm taking the Panthers over the Lightning. I had this pick before they were up 2 nothing. Everybody can relax. Tim, who are your picks in the East? Very similar. I picked Boston as well. Um, and I'm not, a, it's not a homer pick. I had them losing in the second round. I don't think they're going to go on any kind of run, but I do see them getting by Toronto Rangers, obviously Canes, obviously. And I had the lightning and I picked them before the series. I know they're down to nothing, but I'm a man of my word. I stand by my picks, So I'm going to go with the lightning still. You're a great man. You are. All right. In the West, I'm taking the Knights over the stars, even though friend of the show, Matt Duchesne was adamant they were going to win and they wanted to play the Knights. And I said, you got what you wish for here. I'm taking the Canucks over the Nashville Predators. Oilers and Jets. I'm going heavy Canada. Heavy Canada content. Just for the escrow. You got you to make up for that big escrow hit. Who do you have in the West? Yeah, I picked Dallas over Vegas. And I stand by my statement the other day of the winner of that series going all the way to the cup finals. Um, so I, I picked Dallas. I picked uh, the Canucks. 
I picked the Oilers and I picked the Jets. Although the Avs looked pretty good last night in tying that series up, but I'm sticking by Winnipeg. What's going on with Hellebuck? That weird play where he comes out of the net, right? Yeah. Did you see that one? Yeah, Behind he gets net, pocket so. picked. Zach Parisi gets a goal. The ageless wonder. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. He'll don't be know. fine. Is he, Zach Parisi, like the Ray Bork of this playoffs? Or does, no. d- does anybody even know he's on the Colorado Avalanche? <laughs> he's not on anyone's radar. It's, it's Pavelski, I would say, is probably number one. Yeah. Um, and then even on that team, like the Jamie Benz of oh, the yeah, world. Oh, yeah, whole team. Loaded. Ryan Suter, Duchenne has played a 1,000 games. So I think those are the guys, I'd say. Yeah, it's going to be sad when they lose first round. That's mm-hmm. going to be a shame. All right, my former coach, my former team, who coached the team when I played there. Lindy Ruff, it's always better the second time. That's what they say. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And that's what the Buffalo Sabres are doing. They're bringing back fan favorite Lindy Ruff, who was unceremoniously fired by the Buffalo Sabres probably 10 years ago. After he got fired, they spiraled into just inconsistent play, coach after coach, nothing consistent, nothing going right. Well, what do they do? They bring back old Lindy Ruff to right the ship. They fired Donnie Granato at the end of the season. Lindy Ruff was fired by the Devils around the same time as Donnie Granato was fired. They're bringing him back, Tim. They're they're bringing back the group. What do you think? A, A little strange here to try to rehash the historical thing that doesn't usually work out. Do you like this hiring from the Buffalo Sabres? I don't, I don't really like it. I mean, even though the social media post by the Sabres when the news came through said, welcome to Buffalo, Lindy Ruff. They didn't say welcome back. Like, it's strange that, like, they're trying to forget that or pretend yeah. that it never happened the first time around. Um, and I was reading about it this morning on Daily Faceoff, and Frank pointed out, like, he doesn't, he's not even sure there was a real search for a head coach. I think when they saw the job was available for, or that he was available for a new job and they needed a new coach, they were like, hey, let's bring Lindy back. And I have to think there's still some existing relationships with the ownership group and all that where oh, yeah. they liked him and all that, you know. And um, the question I think is like the big thing this offseason that we saw, Tage Thompson spoke at the end of season pressure and he basically, Granado had already been fired and he was like, you know, critical of the guy and, and indirectly to saying stuff like, you know, our room was too relaxed. We were too uh, comfortable. We were too content. We didn't have the fire that we needed, didn't have the leadership that we needed. And uh, he used words like that, which was a reflection of the culture that Granado had set up. And we talked about that. He was a player's coach. Uh, he just didn't have the, the discipline to push him further. So I think Ruff could be that guy. I don't know that he's directly the guy for the job, but I think he'll do a better job of that than Granado did. Um, I don't know. Did you get him over the hump? Did you get him to the playoffs next year? He's a good coach. He really is. He um, And he is a hard-nosed coach. He'll beg your tail. I remember when he was fired. I, we were getting ready to go on the bus to head to the airport for a road trip. And he came on. He's like, I just got gassed. Just got fired, fellas. Sorry. And he left. And that was it. It was such a strange thing. It was the first time I've ever been around a coach being fired midseason. And it was, it was so, it happened a bunch of times in Buffalo when I was there. We had Ron Rolston. He got fired. Ted Nolan comes in. He gets fired. It was just a revolving door of coaches and presidents and GM when, GMs when I was there. But I really liked Lindy Ruff. He was a good coach. He, he knows what he's doing. He's obviously a veteran. Do I think he gets him to the playoffs? Only if Tage is captain, right? I think that's the only way. Tage is, he's obviously throwing his hat into the ring. He's like, we didn't have a good leadership group. Um, six foot six. Like, what do, you, what do you want me to do? I know Owen Power is tall. I know Alex Tuck is tall. Taller. Like, let's go. So... He needs to be captain. If Tage Thompson is captain next year, day one, they make the playoffs 100%. It's not going to be him. It's going to be Darlene. Then they'll never make the playoffs. You name me a good captain who's a, who's a Swede ever. The Dean Zetterberg. I said a good captain. Forsberg. Sundin. Sundin was finished, Lidstrom. wasn't he? Lidstrom. Come on. Yeah, you're right. All right. <laughs> it's going to be Tage. It has to be Tage. But yeah, it just seems too easy to hire Lindy Roth. You know, you're just like, yeah. I don't know. It just Boys club. Boys club. Around, around we go. I'm, I was thinking, when I saw it, I was thinking about reaching out. Like, yeah, you need to 
someone? Let me know. <laughs> yeah. We're here. All right, let's do some quick hits, Tim, and get out of here. What are we talking about today? Andrew Peak, who was the Bruins deadline acquisition on the back end, he's played both games so far, but left game two with an injury. He's out week to week for the Boston Bruins. So they recalled Parker Weatherspoon. Um, or no, so they had they activated Parker Weatherspoon. They recalled um, that yeah, Mason Lowry. And Derek Forbert's actually getting healthy too, which was not supposed to be the case. So they do have the defensive depth, but just uh, we'll see how, who plays in the lineup tonight. Peak's the more of a one, shutdown guy though, right? Like just to stay yeah. at home. Yep. five six defensemen so he's not it's not that huge of an impact no no it's not no it's not okay um the devil's timo meyer underwent shoulder surgery expected to make a full recovery maybe we'll see a better version of him next year especially with a new coach speaking of tall guys ivan fedotov who's that tall russian goalie that the flyers brought over just a few weeks ago signed a two-year 6.5 million dollar extension obviously the whole carter hart thing is you don't know who's going to be between the pipes next year. So now they have at least uh, an idea of who their starter is going to be. And um, yeah, so he's, he's going to be there for two more years. I don't think he played great when he, when he saw the net. It wasn't I mean, outstanding. Like, whoa, this guy's incredible. But you know, Carter Hart made like the end of March. You know, what, what can he do? Right before the playoffs. But, you know, he, he takes the money that Carter, Carter Hart made 3.9, something like that. So it's just to carry over from Carter Hart. We'll see. The last one here, Jacob Voracek, who's been out of the league for a few years, but he officially announced his retirement. Only 34 years old. That was surprising. I would have thought he was older. I'm 33. Jakob. Um, really, Jakob. Yeah. Yeah. So we should have him on the show. He's He's been on other shows. He's pretty good. He's a funny guy. Why would we have him on if other shows have had him on already? Not recently. Oh, okay. Get him on. Jakob Voracek. He was a good player. I like playing against him. Obviously, you know, hit his, hit his prime with the Columbus Blue Jackets. They're a really fun team to watch. Or no, the Philadelphia Flyers, excuse me. Flyers, and, yeah. um, Great passer, know. great playmaker. Yeah, just a moose of a man. Really hard to play against. I enjoyed it. But yeah, 34, that's young. Spring chicken. But he played a hard game. He was actually physical for a European. He got his nose in there. All right, Tim, anything else? No, full slate of games tonight. I'll be up. I'll be watching. I'll be nervous. And uh, we'll see what happens. There's only three games. Funny. That, that's not a full slate. What's the matter enough. with you? That's enough. Or is there four? There's three or four. There's three. Three tonight. All right. We got Bruins. Boston. Yeah. Who's going to win? Bruins, Maple Leafs. Maple Leafs. Oh, look at you. Kings, Oilers. Um, Oilers. Stars, Knights. Stars. All right. I like it. I'm going to go with uh, Bruins, Kings, Knights, the complete opposite of you. Let's Let's have some fun. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate your support. We'll talk to you on Friday. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Dropping the Gloves with John Scott, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode.